I had two cups before I got here this morning, and Papa talked me into having a little bit of that uh, full of sugar, yeah, sugar buzz stuff here. So <laughs> anyway, let's pray. It's, it's really a, a, a blessing and an, and an honor to be here. And I'm really so excited to see your fire for God, man, and just your, your desire to, to speak the truth and love and see people set free. Father, thank you for what you're doing here. Lord, I pray in Jesus' name that you would just move all of us humans out of the way and, and that your Holy Spirit would continue to speak. Lord, I pray in Jesus' name that you would truly touch our hearts. Help us to understand the gay community even more. Help us to understand the dynamics that they're going through. Lord, not to excuse or accept what they're doing, but Lord, as you understood the woman at the well and were able to speak directly into her heart past her smoke screen, Lord, help us to understand the hearts of, of the GLBT community in order to speak through the Holy Spirit past their smoke screen into those direct issues that really true, truly are the root issues in their hearts. Pray for this in Jesus' name. Amen. 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 My name is Dan Hitz. I'm the director of Reconciliation Ministries. And uh, God framed me into being into this ministry as... as he said last night, I want to like sit in the pew and maybe I can do Sunday school and do stuff. Don't ever want to have to share my testimony. Don't ever want to have to look back. You know, when my wife and I got married, it was kind of like, we will speak of this never again. Yeah, you're right. Okay, cool. And that's what I wanted. And thank God he showed me otherwise. Because it's always better when we listen to the Holy Spirit, right? We, we learn some lessons the hard way when we don't listen. But anyway, we've got some resources out here in your um, conference brochure. It talks about some books. There's several books back there after I'm done teaching. We'll have it open. We'll have it open a while um, this evening before the session and then after the session as well. There's some very good resources. And I've also got some ministry resources. We do a program called Living Waters, and it's sexual and relational wholeness through Christ. It covers a wide variety of sexual issues, not just homosexuality, also heterosexual, promiscuity, pornography, addiction, childhood sexual abuse recovery, incest recovery, and transgender issues. It's a very thorough program, very well done. I don't use the phrase very often, this thing changed my life. Because, you know, did you ever read a book that somebody says, read this book, it changed my life? And you read that, yeah, okay, that was good. Um, <laughs> this program <laughs> changed my life, it really did. My wife got a new husband out of the deal, me. My kids got a new husband out of the deal. You'll hear a little bit about my story later. And the author of the Living Waters program, Andrew Comiskey, is coming to Christ Community Church in Roseville about two weeks from now, August 10th. And so there's a good conference. It's $20. Uh, there's flyers back there at the book table. Also, he's going to be speaking Sunday morning at 9 o'clock and 10, 11, 30. 9 o'clock and 11, 30 at the service. Why do people keep showing up at the wrong time? <laughs> <laughs> Did Dan say left or right? Anyway. There's some information here in black and white print, so you'll be able to see it safely. Awesome ministry, awesome guy to see live. He's very prophetic, uh, but also very loving and wants to see people set free at the same time. And then our ministry does a monthly newsletter. We have the snail mail version and also an electronic uh, version via email. There's these yellow pieces of paper. You can sign up for it. And... Uh, Apostle Nikki mentioned Exodus last night. We'll get into a little bit, tiny bit of, about that this morning. In the, the monthly newsletter that just came out, Exodus has announced they're closing down. This is our ministry's response to the closing of Exodus. There's a new ministry, new network out there, Restored Hope Network, that is carrying on the original godly version of what Exodus started out to do 38 years ago. So I'd encourage you to you know, pick this up and read it. But there are also testimonies of men's and women's lives who have changed. Where Exodus is saying, no, no, you can't change. They're, they're really neutering the power of God to change hearts. We've got living proof in front of us every day. And these are some stories, just a few stories of the many men and women who have been changed. But anyway, uh, we are also on Facebook. So if you search Reconciliation Ministries on Facebook, please like us because it's nice to have friends. <laughs> like us on Facebook. But our brother this morning shared a, a bunch of stories, a bunch of uh, science reports and stuff. I have links to some of those that he mentioned on the Facebook page. I'll also show you some other sources for scientific um, studies and, and summaries of studies, because the studies themselves are about that thick. 
So I'm one of these, you know, C-spot run kind of guys that like the summaries of those studies, so I'll give you some places for that. But anyway, um, find us on Facebook. And by the way, be careful because you know how the enemy hijacks words? Gay means happy, if you look in a typical, you know, when we were kids, you know, gay means happy, but it doesn't anymore. And so the enemy hijacks words, so when you're on Facebook looking for Reconciliation Ministries, unfortunately, there is a branch of the church that has hijacked the word reconciliation to be now promoting homosexuality. And we're going to reconcile your hurt feelings, you know, back into the church. Now, they are addressing a need, which really brings up there is a problem where the church has wounded the homosexual community. The church has wounded those who tried to come out. And I've had clients come to me and say, Dan, you know, X number of years ago, probably 20 or so years ago, I went to my church pastor and said, please help me. I'm struggling with homosexuality. I need help. The pastors or that church's response is, you know, we don't know how to help you. We can't help you here. So you need to go somewhere else and get that help. But when you're done, come on back here. We'll welcome you back. Wow. Ouch. The good news is that church is now a faithful monthly supporter of us. They've seen that, wait a minute, that's not the way to handle it. And that's a beautiful redemption of the church. So if you have been hurt by the church, for those of you who are struggling with homosexuality, you've been hurt, I want to apologize on behalf of the body of Christ. There are some hurt things out there. And, you know, come back to Jesus. Let him really, let's deal with those hurts. And let's see Jesus help you. When I went to church, the pastor knew my story. He didn't know how to help me. But I was in that church, I don't know how many years. And one day he was preaching and he said, you know, in my day, if you were a hostess Twinkie, you got beat up. Holy smokes. I'm on his staff. He knows me. He knows how much I've dealt with self-hatred. And so I went to him and said, yo, brother, I know you. I know your heart. But I'm telling you what, if I would have walked into this church and heard you say that from the pulpit the first day, first while, you would have never seen my face again. And fortunately, he corrected it, which was a blessing. So we do need to speak up, speaking the truth and love to our pastors, you know, and, and the Lord convicted me of some of the phrases I used. These are men and women of God who God created who are struggling with whatever they're struggling with. And we need to be respectful of them as we lead them to the Savior who can change their hearts. And that's a beautiful thing. So let's start with some questions. Let's start with a few questions. And these are kind of rhetorical. You can kind of answer them out loud. And even Ron can, I told Ron he couldn't answer these questions because he heard this teaching before, but he can. <laughs> How many of you think people are born gay? We know the church answer. We know the cultural answer, right? Um, do people choose to be gay? We know cultural answer. We know church answer. Which one's correct? Maybe what if it's somewhere in between? Is change possible? And what does change mean? So if I repent and walk away from homosexuality, will I stop having same-sex attractions? And if I truly do get delivered and I meet God at the deliverance altar, does that mean that no longer ever, ever anymore will I ever be tempted? And if I am tempted with same-sex attraction, does that mean, seriously, Dan, you're just kidding yourself. You really are gay. You need to stop suppressing your natural desire, your God-given gift of diversity, and just you know, embrace your gay Christian identity. This is what culture is hearing. This is a firestorm. It directly contradicts what the Christians are saying. It invites homophobic labels, bigot labels, hate monger labels. It's also in their agenda to let it invite homophobic, hate monger, hateful, bigoted attacks. And so we'll look at some of that. But our answers to these questions, they, they can really help or hinder how we reach into the gay community. Because there's such, even in the church, there is such a contradictory firestorm of answers. Everything from full acceptance of homosexuality to absolute rejection to the point of saying you can't even really be redeemed from it. You're going to fry in hell. Don't even worry. Just write it all off. And neither one of those extremes is correct. But guess what? The GLBT community so often equates all of us with either this one or that one. And it needs to be really 
founded on the word of God. I wish there was a scripture that, that you know, thus saith the Lord, knock it off. And there <laughs> kind of sort of is. But really, it's Jesus speaking the truth in love, knowing what the woman at the well was really trying to solve through her sinful behavior so that he can speak into that true legitimate need in her heart with a holy solution, with a holy way to do some work. The conflicting messages keep the people we're trying to reach from really hearing the truth of the gospel, that God so loved the world that he gave his one and only son that whoever believes in him shall not perish, but shall have eternal life. That's really what we need. You know, and so often homosexuality gets singled out as a sin above every sin. I love this verse, though, in 1 Corinthians 6, 9 through 10. You know, everyone that teaches and preaches has 8 million favorite verses. This is my favorite verse at 11.04 on Friday the 26th. At 11.06, we might have a different favorite verse. But anyway, for <coughs> 1 Corinthians 6, 9 through 10, don't you know that those who do wrong will have no share in the kingdom of God? Don't fool yourselves. Those who indulge in sexual sin, who are idol worshipers, adulterers, male prostitutes, homosexuals, thieves, greedy people, drunkards, abusers, and swindlers, none of these will have a share in the kingdom of God. And so often you hear these scriptures thumped, thumping you over the head from the pulpit. But notice something here. Homosexuals is in the middle of this list. And you've got things like prostitutes. Well, yeah, we know they're in bad shape. Adulterers, yeah, we know those people are bad. But wait a minute, now you're, now you're getting a little bit excessive here. Greedy, drunk, you know, drunk, swindlers, you know. It, I don't think swindlers would cover, like, cheating on their taxes. What? Hmm, maybe it does. I don't know. But anyway, homosexuality is in the middle of this thing. But I love verse 11. There was a time when some of you were just like that. But you have, but now your sins have been washed away. You have been set apart for God. You have been made right with God because of what the Lord Jesus Christ and the Spirit of our God have done for you. 2,000-year-old evidence that we can change. We didn't need to spend all this money in research, man. The Bible right here says we can change. And incidentally, contrary to what you will hear in the media, we have about 100 years' worth of research that shows sexual orientation can be changed. And we'll talk about that in a little while. But if we're going to speak against homosexuality as a sin, which it is, we need to speak against all sin as sin. Heterosexual sin as well as homosexual sin. You know, the scripture, that one verse, it says something along the lines of flee sexual immorality. All other sin occurs outside the body. Sexual immorality occurs inside the body. That shows me then there's a special warning, something about in your body. Temple of the Holy Spirit, man, flee it. It's worse. It's a bigger trap than some of the others. It has some far-reaching consequences. We know that when we join with somebody sexually, we're in our spirits with them. It has far-reaching consequences. But if we're going to speak against homosexuality, let's be redemptive as we do it. But let's also address the male and the female shacking up before they're married, or the teenage boy or younger 10-year-old kid sitting at his computer checking out the porn sites by the hour. So let's look at these things. Again, redemptively, we need to speak the word of truth. We need to speak conviction. But redemption, there's an answer. There is a way out. You're looking for something that you think you can find in sexual sin. It's not going to satisfy. It's going to leave you devoured. So let's look at what we do have. Some of this is just going to be teaching and just basic teaching terms and definitions. Homosexuality, um, sexual desire or behavior directed toward a person or persons of one's own sex. Pretty, pretty much a duh explanation, real true. But when you struggle with it, it really helps to realize, wait a minute, okay, temptation is not the sin. The acting on it is the sin. The pressing play on the DVD player in your brain is the sin. The fact that you have same-sex desire is something you've got to deal with, but it doesn't mean you are a space alien in Christ. You are the leper at church, and we need to shun you. It means this is something that you have to deal with, as we all have something to deal with. 
but it's no sin to be tempted. I needed to hear that. I needed to hear that. I spent so many years in self-hatred as a Christian because I continued to have same-sex attractions. It's like, wait a minute, if I'm a new creation in Christ, why on earth am I still tempted? And I hated myself and really wished an asteroid would just kind of fall through the ceiling and land on my head. And so I want to bring out it's not a sin to be tempted. It means you have something to deal with. Like everyone that is still breathing has something to deal with. The GLBT community. Now, incidentally, they keep adding alphabets to this. Yeah. All right. And it's just questioning, transgender. They'll use the phrase queer, all of these things. We're going to look at the basic ones, what that means. Gay, gay back 15 years ago or so used to mean not just homosexual, not just that you would do it on, in the sly or be quiet about it on the down low, but that you were actually promoting it out in your face. I am gay. I want everyone to know it. And it used to mean that. Now, culturally, it just means, yeah, you're gay, you like guys, or you're gay, you like girls. And so it's kind of applied. We're going to look at it kind of in the terms of a homosexual man. Um, the, the traditional sense was gay, promoting it out there in the open. But really, the kids will use this just as you like dudes, you're gay, okay, or you think you may. Um, lesbian, homosexual, female, bisexual, attracted to both sexes, transgendered. And this is something a little bit where it gets a little technical. Transgendered specifically is you were born with one body type, but you believe you're supposed to be a different body type. It's different than transvestite. So a lot of times we in the church, we'll just lump this all together. Yeah, there's a guy wearing a dress. It's got to be transgender. Not necessarily. So transvestism is a guy that cross-dresses for some reason. He gets a sexual charge out of dressing as a female. Transgender is I actually want to become or live as identify as. And again, the way that we handle these topics can be kind of a hindrance to us as we talk to people in this community. At the same time, I'll tell you, don't not talk to the people in the community because you don't feel like you know enough. You have all struggled with something. You have all walked away from something. So on that standpoint, you know what it's like to struggle with some desire that you are screaming for that the Lord is saying, don't. So anyway, gay affirming and on the rise, it just, it broke my heart. Basically, in the same short time frame when Exodus International closed down. Well, and Exodus used to be the largest organization international that helped men and women walk away from homosexuality. In the U.S., they have closed down. In the rest of the world, they have not adopted the same theology that the U.S. version of Exodus has. That's Exodus Global Alliance. They're catching a lot of flack because it's the name related organizations they have a lot of damage to control to do now, but in the U.S., but the same week they announced they were closing down, within a, a week or two, DOMA was turned down, and all of this stuff happened in the Supreme Court. So anyway, it, it's been interesting, but there's a rise in gay-affirming churches, and that ought not to be. We are loving people into hell. We're, we, you know, we're trying to compensate for the God-hates-fags people by loving them in a false doctrine that's going to lead them to destruction. And that doesn't work. So some, some brief notes on evangelism. Relationship evangelism is really earning the right, speaking the truth in love to these people to be able to speak into their lives. Like uh, Apostle Nikki says, we need to speak the truth in love. It's even on the, the conference information and name. If we go around thumping them with the Bible without the love, it's not going to work. But if they know that we are who we are, we are Dan, or we are Ron, or Chris, or whoever, and we may think differently and believe different, have different core values, but I can still respect you as an individual, as a man or a woman that God created. If they know that, it's easier for us to speak the truth that, you know what? I know you, you think that being gay is okay, and I know that for you it's as natural as breathing, but I have to tell you that God says it's not okay. But God has made a way of redemption. God has made a way out for all of us that have sinful, illicit desires to walk towards his holiness in relationship with him. What on earth do you think possesses a grown adult to wear a pink poodle on his head and the tie-dye shirts? 
What possesses somebody to do that? Maybe he's been shunned all of his life. Maybe when he was 10, he was a kid that got called faggot before he even knew what on earth a faggot was. Maybe he was bullied. Maybe he was. So he finally found a group of people that respect him and accept him. Even when he wears a pink poodle hat in a bright pink, yellow, blue, whatever, tie-dye shirt out in the middle of public. And that ought not to be so. They shouldn't feel more accepted at a gay bar than they do in church. But that's the reality that we're dealing with. And so I had, I used to work in a, a school district in the TV department many, many years ago. I'm, you know, I'm, I'm like you. Most of the time I'm pretty laid back. And, you know, I'm not cool enough to be a youth pastor. I don't have the energy. It's like sports. No, nah, I'm going to sit around and watch you guys. Maybe I'll take some pictures. That's exercise, right? That finger on the shutter. That's, well, I got to work out today. Yeah, but it was cool because some of these kids would come in, and they knew I was conservative. I had the Bible on my desk. They knew at that point I didn't even dance, didn't even listen to rock and roll music, all this stuff. Yet they would know, and they would come in, and they would talk. And I would share with them what I could. It was challenging. Got called in the principal's office once and the other administrator's office once. But uh, it was challenging. But they knew where I stood. But they also knew that I cared about them. And I love them. So it gives us the ability to speak into their heart, even when there's a contention, even when there's a disagreement. And that's so important. We never, ever, ever compromise our Christian convictions. Yes, Jesus ate with publicans and sinners, but they still knew where Jesus stood. He never took part in their sin. He never reinforced their sin. He never encouraged their sin. He always encouraged um, holiness. And like our sister says, he wasn't afraid to go there. God's not afraid to go, you know, the, the disciples are like, man, you know what? The image consultant said, don't say that no more, you know? But Jesus isn't afraid of his image. He's not worried. He's afraid of our eternal. He's concerned with our eternal benefit. So as far as looking at how to reach out, all of this stuff, what goes on in the mind of somebody struggling with homosexuality? I'm going to give you a brief Reader's Digest version of Dan's testimony. First of all, I was born. <laughs> surprise, surprise. I was not hatched somewhere. I was not found in a cabbage patch, but before I was born, I spent nine months in my mom's womb. She was paranoid schizophrenic. And you know, when the baby's in the womb, what's going on in the mom's heart is going on in that baby's body, man. I'm feeling all this stuff. So really born, I believe, with the spirit of rejection. Spirit of rejection, I'm not good. Life was crazy growing up. Um, one of my earliest memories was sitting right here, looking out this window, watching my brother and a bunch of kids get on the school bus. And I was thinking, man, I'm, they won't let me go to school. I must not be good enough to go to school. And that's an example of, you know, little kids, great sponges of information, but just don't have the skill set to interpret that information correctly. And the devil takes advantage of that and creates a huge stronghold. Yep, Dan, you're not good enough to go to school. You're not good enough. You don't belong. And I lived with that mindset. That was my identity. That was the filter running. Kind of like you, you're just used to it, so you don't hear those voices, but they're talking. Kind of like this, this little fan over here, which you don't really hear until you concentrate on it. And we're so busy, we just kind of shut that down, and we just push on through. Um, when I was a little boy, my mom sexually abused me twice in the bathtub. And that just, what's a little kid like uh, Sister Krista here saying, you know, your brain's not even developed to deal with that kind of stuff. So I dealt with it by shutting off the circuit breakers in my heart. Click, don't feel. Click, don't feel. Click, go somewhere else, wherever that happens to be. And it really just did such a harmful thing. And so there I am kind of floating around with that. And then here's Dad. Dad was a nice guy, I realize now, but he was so detached. He was so overloaded with Mom, with life. I'm the last of the five kids with four other kids. How do we even survive? And I remember one time I was really happy. You know how little boys talk so much? You know, this was before they told me I'm not supposed to talk in the bathroom. So my dad was shaving in the bathroom, and I went up to him, and he had that all half shaving cream on his face. And I'm talking all excited and just want to hear about life and happy to talk to my dad. And my dad looked at me and said, would you stop asking me so many questions before I turn into a monster again? And I remember thinking, monster again. Monster, you've done this before. I don't know what my dad as a monster will do, but it will be bad. So I have to go away again. Click. And so that severed my relationship with my dad, who really was a good man. It doesn't matter what the facts on the ground are. 
My perception now is you mess with dad, he turns into a monster. And so this huge wall goes up there, and I can't receive the dadness, that infilling that our brother talked about, the Holy Spirit, creating parents and the dads especially to teach the little boys, this is what it's like to be a boy. This is what it's like to go through life as an adolescent when we really need some help there and some downloads. This is what it's like to be a man. And I shut that all off, and there I am. I was raised in the church. I didn't have much relationship, but I kind of liked this idea of God, you know, whatever. It's something cool there, but didn't really know about it. I, I was raised in the church enough to let me know the rules, right? Because when you have a dysfunctional home, when it's dangerous at home, when there are landmines at home, if you learn the rules, then maybe you won't step on a landmine. Or maybe you will because the landmines change. But if you learn the rules, you, you probably have a better chance of maybe getting through there without a freak out explosion. So I look at this picture, my Mr. Spock picture, no emotion. Because when you live in a dysfunctional home, you can't afford to feel. Because what happens if you feel in a dysfunctional home? What will you feel? You don't feel safety. You feel terror because mom does weird things. You feel abandonment because dad's not there. You feel like you're all alone. Hopeless. I'm at risk. There is nobody to get me through life but me. So that has to be shut down. And you can just see it on my face. You know, just kind of going through life, the quiet kid that doesn't talk, so he must be okay, right? By the way, there are different personalities. If I were more gregarious, what if I'm the class clown that drives a teacher crazy? And he's a class clown because he's not getting attention at home. And he's so desperate inside. And just he's wired to have that little have fun gland in his brain that goes off at inappropriate times. But there he is. And so grade school. I knew right from wrong. I knew what's supposed to happen, what's not supposed to happen. I can remember checking out other little boys sexually on the playground. Didn't even know what you're supposed to do sexually, but I remember sexually curious about little boys because I was experimenting with a neighborhood kid, just doing some stuff. But anyway, back in our day, remember, you know, they, I don't know if they still do it now. Do they have, like, the two jocks in the classroom, the, the boys that entered puberty at, like, eight as the team captains, and then they pick their team? I'll take that kid, I'll take that kid. Okay, they did that back in my day. But what happens if you're a creative little kid that doesn't like sports, and I still don't like baseball, and no, I'm not going to a healing seminar where they teach us to play baseball. Might be a healing prayer session there. But anyway, I was always picked after. You know, the boys would get picked, then the girls would get picked, and then there's Dan. And I remember, oh, yeah, come on, hits, be on our team, whatever. And I was just like, please send me out to that part. What is it, the left field where the balls rarely go? Please send me out there and let me disappear. But by the way, you've just told me I am not one of the boys because you don't even want to have me on your team after the girls. So there I go. Detached, heart turned off, can't feel, can't have needs, can't dream, can't desire. That's all too dangerous when you're going through dysfunction. So there I am in sixth grade. You can tell early 70s, bold enough to wear a pink rose-colored shirt. Some issues there, maybe, but no one addressed. I wish I would have had you for a teacher. Son, seriously, the rose shirt, that's got to go. It would have been, it would have been mercy. <laughs> Leave it at home, let your sister wear the thing, not in my room, you know. But I knew right from wrong. I knew the rules, trying not to step on landmines. So I knew that when I started having same-sex attractions, it was wrong. I'm supposed to like the girls, but I like the boys. This isn't wrong. Or this isn't right. This is what's going on. And I dealt with it like I've been dealing with things all my life. Click, click, click. With the exception of sexually experimenting with another boy in the classroom in sixth grade. And I was simultaneously shamed, grossed out, felt dirty, intrigued, thought this is cool. I'm getting attention and a connection. And that's, by the way, why the older men in the church can pray upon the younger ones. I'm getting a connection here. This kid accepts me. In some ways, even though I'm grossed out, we're speaking some of the same language. And there's a sinful belonging that happens that we're all so hungry for. Remember the woman at the well. What's the deeper issue beyond sexual immorality? 
this kid fit a longing in my heart. So I liked the boys, not supposed to, turned them off. High school comes around, graduated in 79. My curling iron, my hair dryer, feathering the hair out, that was all going on there. And the hormones really, really start dumping into my system. And I notice I really, really, really like the boys. Off, off. Went to a school in the farming community. I, I went to school in Bay City, Michigan, which is by Auburn. I don't know if you guys know. Auburn's out in the middle of nowhere, kind of country-ish. Yeah, somewhere on the hand there. Kind of country-ish. There was one effeminate boy in that school out of about 700 students, and everybody ripped on him and called him Twitch. I thought, I sure have enough problems. I am not going to be called Twitch Jr. So I will talk. I must have looked like a robot walking through school masculinely. Somebody told me I walk funny once, and oh, I do. Somebody told me I talk funny once. I do. Oh, my goodness. I will not talk funny then. I will talk like a guy. And it was really hard to process this thing. And I found something else. I found theater at that point. I was a creative kid. Thank God I did. It gave me a place to hide. I could read my script. Y'all paid your money. You got to like me or else walk out. But there's an orchestra pit between you and me. I'm up here being somebody else, and I'm getting attention. You all can go away. Incidentally, God's redeemed that. I can be real. You're, all, you're getting me as I'm talking to you. But back in high school, you got whatever the script said you were supposed to get. And that was a great place to hide. When I was about 17, mom had a major meltdown. Demonic, psychotic, all three, all, you know, demonic, psychotic, schizophrenic, all rolled together. And I thought she prepositioned me. I freaked. For about a minute and a half, I freaked. I lost all control of my emotions, freaked. Somehow, by God's grace, excuse me, my dad was able to calm my mother and me down both. But I came out of that time with three major vows made. One was, I will never get married. Because, see, even though I had same-sex attractions, I wanted this normal life. I wanted to be married, have kids. But at this point, there is no way I will get married. Because if my wife ever does to me what my mom has done to my dad, I will be the one in the psych ward. The second one was, sorry, ladies, all women are psycho chicks. Run, they're crazy, they're all dangerous. Let's just lump them all in this big category of crazy. And they can go over there. And the, that book, What Women Are From Venus, let's just ship them all back. And we'll all be safe. The third vow was, I need somewhere to be safe. And you see where this is going, right? Someone has to be safe. So I believe the lie that all men are safe. And I remember thinking, wait a minute. In high school, I had a friend named Ron. His dad was mentally ill. And I thought about this. Wait a minute. No, because all men are safe. But Ron's dad, he's mentally ill, too. So all men are not safe. Overload. Short, so you can't flip the circuit breaker here. No, uh, uh-uh. Uh-uh. All men are safe. Literally like Romans chapter 1 says, I chose to believe a lie that all men are safe and put it on the shelf. I can remember clearly having that debate in my mind. How do I reconcile this? I'm going to reconcile it by turning off the truth. I'm in the theater. I can create my own place to be. And so I spent college chasing Mr. Wright. And, you know, I had cystic acne. That was really shameful. That was painful. So I thought, if I, if I can't give him a perfect body, man alive, I'm not going to give him a fat one. I probably weighed about what I do now. And I said, I'm not going to give him a fat body. I went down to 125 pounds. And I was probably a little bit taller than I am now because I guess you start shrinking when you get to be 50-ish. So might have been a little bit taller than I am now, but 125 and I was still too fat. I got sick of starving myself, so I turned bulimic. That went on for about three or four years. Couldn't go more than three days without a food binge. Now, remember, sinful behavior is a sinful, illegitimate way to try and fix a legitimate problem. So kind of jump in my head here. What do you think is some of the root issues here my sinful solution was to cram myself full of food. What do you think the real issue is there? That hideous emptiness, that hideous void, the spirit of death that I'm walking around with, that I'm embracing, that I'm wishing I would die, trying to fill up that hole in my heart with food. It worked for about 30 seconds until I realized now I'm fat, so now I've got to either puke or take a whole box of x lax or do something. That was my life. Had a sinful, really codependent, sick relationship with Mr. Wright or the guy I thought was Mr. Wright for about seven years. It didn't turn sexual toward until the end, not because 
I wasn't willing, but because he wasn't willing. I was the one pushing, but at the same time, he kept it going. And so different time, different, different place. It probably would have turned sexual much quicker in 2013. But there I was, wanting to be dead, embracing death. Did consider jumping off the dorm roof at one point, but it was only four stories high. There was a convenient dumpster down below. It's only four stories high. If I jump off, I'm probably going to just screw it up. I don't want to do Christmas cards with a toothbrush, a paintbrush in my teeth for the rest of my life. Can't go there. And I interpret it as wussing out and didn't do it, even though everything within me really kind of wanted to be dead. But God, and I love this, I had the other hots for a guy I worked with in the video production department, and work sent us on a conference in Denver. And we went camping for a week before that. Now you can imagine what I was hoping would happen. He, he was a Christian. He was a faithful guy. And I realize now looking at this, one of the things I was attracted to was that he was a Christian and a clean, holy person. I was, I was drawn to that, misinterpreting everything, but drawn to it. He had everybody and their grandma praying for us. So I would, never, I would never recommend my son go camping with some unsaved reprobate that he works with for a week in Denver. Thank God in this case it happened. Because at the end of that conference, or just before the conference, the boss was going to take us to a bar, and he was kind of like, well, you know what? You can probably tell I really don't want to go. This is why. Incidentally, it was one of the most awkward, goofy, cliche-filled witnessing experiences that you could ever have. It was, it was kind of goofy, and it still worked. Because in there, the Holy Spirit's planting those seeds. Dan, everybody in their life at one point has to say yes or no to God. I don't know if this is your point, but if this is, what are you going to say? I got saved not because the Holy Spirit just dumped buckets full of anointing on me from heaven. I got saved because I did not want to go to hell. Pure and simple. I was at finally confronted with God's authority, the truth spoken in love, even awkwardly recognizing my life is incompatible with eternal life and with God's plan and God's acceptability factor. I actually put off getting saved for a couple days so I could come back home here and lived in Royal Oak, come back home and sin for a little bit more. Then I'll get saved, seriously. So don't give up. The other lesson to that if you get blown off, keep speaking the truth in love. Don't give up because it's stuck. So I got saved. I was, still, I was still pretty broken. I was still pretty turned off. You know, when you get saved, the Holy Spirit doesn't fix everything all at once. Really wish he would. Well, part of me wishes he would. Part of me realizes because he values relationship in the redemption. And in the sanctification process, it's that father, God, daddy relationship stuff that's awesome and beautiful. You don't recognize that all at once. But there were times where God would say, Dan, we got we to gotta start talking about you growing up with your mom. We got to start talking about, uh, you know, your abandonment from your dad. Talk to the hand, God. Talk to the hand, Holy Spirit. And I, I, I spent many years blowing off the Holy Spirit, keeping that wall up, keeping my heart turned off. Doing the Christian calisthenics, right? Because we all know if we just, we shove all that pain down and we pray enough and we worship enough and we go to church enough and we do all the right things enough, we all know that's going to just change us instantly, right? <laughs> Wrong answer. It takes relationship. God wants relationship. But God does answer prayer. God does answer and honor Bible reading, worship and all that. So he broke the terror of women down to a fear of women to the point where I could get married a few years after I got saved. And the last time I was here, I pointed out, contrary to the look on my wife's face, she really was happy that we got married that day. <laughs> she's, she's ecstatic here. You can just see her all ecstatic, you know. She doesn't like pictures. She's an awesome woman. We have, we, we have been married now for all 26 and a half years. But it's awesome. It's, it's God's mercy. But I let her think I was more fixed than I was. Cool, because that way I don't have to deal with stuff. Yeah, okay. And frankly, I was telling myself I was more fixed than I really was, right? Denial is not just a river in Egypt. But anyway, there we go. Still broken. One of the cool things is God sent me. I was doing video production, you know, Bachelor of Science degree. 
doing pretty good working for a public schools, and God said, hey, you know, quit that job and go do construction that you're not geared toward, and you get paid by the foot, and you get to work outside all winter when it's snowing. <laughs> Man, sign me up. <laughs> but it was awesome because I learned how to work with men. You have no idea how valuable that was and is to me, learning how to work with men, learning how to become one of the guys when you do not feel like one of the guys. When the first time you go up on the little ranch roof that grandma could probably go on with her wheelchair, and I had tears in my eyes. And I remember thinking, man, if Rick sees me crying, I am dead meat, so I better not live. But God sent me there for about four years to learn how to work with guys. It was a Christian construction company, and that was such a valuable time, but still so shut down, still so, so shut down. Healing comes, though, when we wrestle with God. Now, my wife says I'm stubborn, but I will never, ever admit that I'm stubborn. I'm just a little bit opinionated. So I kept that Christian two-step going for a good probably 15 years. I'm a slow learner, too. Uh-uh, not feeling, not doing it, not doing it. Three emotional dependencies happened along the way with other men that if God would not have intervened, would have turned sexual. I was not dealing with the issues. I didn't want to embrace homosexuality in here. I didn't want to embrace ungodliness in here and in some parts of here. But I never let the Holy Spirit have access to those wounded, broken areas in my heart that I was trying to numb through fantasy or through whatever in that belief that, you know, if this guy somehow through osmosis, I could hook up with him or just be with him, then everything gets fixed. And so I got to the point where I didn't want to live anymore. I'm in the ministry. I got kids. I love my wife. I love the ministry. I love my kids. I can't do this anymore. I got in my car and cried out to the Lord for probably 45 minutes. God, take these feelings away. Everything I have tried to do, God, to change myself has not worked. Will you please do, Lord, whatever it takes to fix me? And it was my Jacob wrestling with God moment. Jacob's wrestling with God. God looks at him and says, what's your name? Seriously? We're in the middle of a fight. You want to know what my name is? Yeah, what's your name? My name's Jacob. Deceiver, supplanter. God, everything I've tried to do to fix myself for the last 15 years has not worked. Will you please do whatever it takes to fix me? It was finding my moment of brokenness. You know, here I'm wanting a meteorite literally to fall on my head, kill me, take me home, because I can't kill myself. I don't want to go to hell, but I can't live like this anymore. I can't jump into sin. God, please just get me out of here. And God says, I have something better. I have a relationship with me as your heavenly father, with Jesus Christ as your brother and a friend that sticks closer than the brother and your redeemer. And I have beautiful comfort and truth through the Holy Spirit. In that, in relationship with me and safe others, you will be changed. And through a divine accidental phone call, I accidentally met the man that ran the ministry that I'm running now. And we accidentally, through the Holy Spirit, connected. And I finally went through the group that we have, Living Waters, and I was finally honest with the hurt, the fear. You know what? I know I'm supposed to hate sin, but I love some of the idea of sin. And frankly, I'm kind of ticked off at God that he says it's sin because I really think it's a great idea. I had to be honest. I'm, I'm telling you, I like sin. How many of you struggle with smashing your thumb with a hammer? It ain't fun. How many of you struggle drinking another half a gallon of that cool iced coffee stuff in the refrigerator? with God knows how much uh, sugar is in it. I do. That stuff tasted good. Or eating a whole Jets pizza. I, it sounds like a great idea to me. We struggle with that because we like it. And I had to admit, God, I struggle with same-sex attraction, fantasies, masturbation, wanting to look at porn because I like it. But God, I don't want to like it. I want to love what you love and hate what you hate. Right now, I don't. But God, change me. And God, okay, uncle, I will talk to you about my mom abusing me. I will talk to you about the terror. I will talk to you, God, about developing really good peripheral vision as a kid because I was too scared to walk through my own house without looking behind the door when I walked in. God, I will talk to you about needing to put this huge metal container of pennies at the bottom of my bedroom door every night because that way if my mom breaks into my room to abuse me, the door will hit the pennies and I will wake up as they are sliding across the floor. I had to go there. We spend so much energy trying to shove those feelings down, those terror, fears down, and it doesn't work because it comes out somewhere else. 
The pain comes up. We don't want to go there, so we go look at porn and masturbate. The pain comes up. We don't want to go there. We get a 12-pack. The pain comes up. We don't want to go there. We hook up with somebody. But we have to go there with Jesus, and it's important with safe other men and women in the body of Christ. And as I went there, the healing came. I, yeah, I didn't want this kind of ministry. I just, like, eh, no, let me just do like a, can we do like the folding chair ministry? And maybe the, the broom ministry and sweep the floor up after. That's kind of fun, you know. But God brought me to the point where, Dan, I have given you a drink of water. You have friends who are dying in the desert who need that drink of water. What are you going to do? And I had to say, okay, God, I'll dispense your water, your living water. I'll reach out. I'll do it. Uh, no one's skillful when they start something, right? We don't know what on earth we're doing. We, we're, we're just plodding through life. So whatever God puts on your heart to do, you do to the best of your ability. And you work at it. God will show you how to do it. And God began to show me how to do these things. And today, one of the, the, the great privileges and honors and blessings from the job is being able to minister with the grace that I've been comforted with all over the world. And, you know, I'm, I am, I post on Facebook a couple of days ago, I'm like recovering from being the most de emotionally detached, codependent, self-sufficient, leave me alone guy that I ever knew. Talk about con contradictions. Yet now today, because of the redemption of Jesus, I have friends all over the world. This picture's in Thailand. I'm, I get the privilege of going there in October and seeing some friends from the Philippines that God used at a time in my life that was very low to minister his healing from literally the other side of the world. And that's what God wants to do for all of us. And so had I walked into my church and heard my pastor say, in my day, if you were a hostess Twinkie, you got beat up, I shudder to think of where I would be. If I were... 20, however old I was, 23-ish years old today, just getting saved. And I heard Alan Chambers say, I'm sorry for all the harm we've caused you in X gay ministry. I'm sorry we told you you could change. And you can still go to heaven, by the way, being gay. Why bother? Change is hard work. It's hard. It's excruciating to get those spiritual Holy Spirit root canals with no Novocaine until the Holy Spirit comes in and removes the pain, and then it's blessing of relationship and the renewed foundation and so it's so important speaking that truth in love speaking that truth in love so marion and i here we are now she's smiling <laughs> it's funny um desert stream asked hey can you have marianne share a little testimony at our conference in, on august 10th i said i will pay money to whoever can get her to say something in public. She's a beautiful, sweet woman, man. She's got a tender, just beautiful heart. She don't like pictures, and she doesn't like speaking in front of people. But she's a beautiful woman, seriously. My best friend and, and the best blessing the Lord's given me after salvation. And so I wish I could say, hey, happily ever after, cool. So now you know how to reach gay people, and everything's fine, and they'll never struggle again after they go through living waters and get to a certain point. But let's talk now about discipleship. I was so blessed to hear Apostle Peggy Joe talking about, you know, it's not just one trip to the deliverance altar and their science. They need discipleship. We've trained ourselves how to live gay. We've trained ourselves how to embrace sin. We need help. And there's times in our life where we need the body of Christ desperately. And so things are going great. Man, my brain was working efficiently. Things were going well for me. Loving it and just, it was one of those times where you know how like you feel like you're in the rhythm of the Holy Spirit, you're riding that wave, it's just, I love those times. I was in one of those times when I got a phone call early in the morning, and it was every parent's worst nightmare. It was my wife, I've never heard her so frantic in all my life, saying, come home now. Letting me know that my, um, one month away from 18-year-old son had died, and the world came crashing down. You know, and that grief cycle that they talk about is so real. It came crashing down. And this is where the relapse prevention comes in. This is where the reality being honest as man alive, me be honest, I'm the leader of this ministry to help people overcome homosexuality. How can I be honest because I'm struggling? Yeah, be honest. Get over ourselves. We are really not that big of a deal. If you want to make sure that you know you're not a big deal, go ask your teenage kids, hey, am I a big deal? That's all I need to say. <laughs> and I love my kids. They love me, but that's all we need to say. <laughs> Am I something special? Oh, okay. 
But anyway, I'll tell you, there, are, there were times in the grace cycle, especially early on, where, where I heard that familiar voice, you know, you can make this pain go away. All you need to do is grab your kid's laptop, go lock yourself in his bedroom where he died, and look at gay porn and masturbate your brains out and pound some beer, and you can make that pain go away. And so that was my temptation. It was strong. That's, I, it seems like a great idea because I don't like this pain. By God's grace, I reached out to safe brothers in the body of Christ. I reached out to safe people. People came out of the woodwork. But if they didn't, I went to them. And I shared my heart. I shared, I want to go do these things. And by God's grace, I have met God in some beautiful, powerful ways that I would never have been able to meet him any other way. I'm not at the point where I'd say I would never change this for anything. Trust me. You know, I'd rather you know, beam him back here, Lord, except he'd be ticked off because he's having a great time up here. We're the ones stuck down here. But anyway, it was the treasures of darkness that Isaiah talks about. Seeing God as dad. God, God is dad that doesn't say shut up. Stop asking me questions. But the God that could take any question I could dish at him, and believe me, there are a lot of them, and not all with a good attitude. And God could handle that. And meeting the Father as a beautiful, loving Father that's not checked out, that does speak into life, that does call me when I need to be corrected, but encourage me when I need to go forward. And that's the beautiful thing. Someday we'll be together. But we're stuck here now. So let's not be stuck here. Let's thrive. And that's the real reality of relapse, French and man. We have, in, in whatever pain we were in before we got saved and even after we got saved, we trained our bodies, our brains, brain science, our hearts, our, our flesh to respond to sin, to enjoy sin, to find medication. Big surprise that those old patterns get thrown back us by Satan who has a fistful of fiery darts. Even Jesus, who never did sin, was tempted. We trained our bodies and brains and hearts to respond to sin, so let's not be surprised if we are tempted. And that's something important to say to the younger generation who say, if I'm still tempted, then I haven't changed. Look, there's a continuum of change. I wish I could tell you I had no more same-sex attraction. I will tell you there's a fraction of what it used to be, but it's still there. So if it rears its ugly head, you know how you have those times of temptation where it's just, yeah, whatever, go out, go away in Jesus' name. And it's like no big deal. Then there's those times of temptation where Satan's playing the bongos on your head with a hammer, really throwing them at you. And I've learned during those times of temptation, go to a safe brother in Christ. Or if you're a female, go to a safe sister in Christ. I am being tempted in this direction. Let's go to Jesus and find out what I'm trying to medicate from, escape from. And thus let's ask Jesus what his holy answer is. And there's an, actually there's a couple of newsletter articles about that. I'm praying about your temptations beyond your temptations and understanding your attraction profile. But the more I do that, the more it goes away. So that is a short journey inside of Dan's brain, which is never going to be a long one anyway. But a short journey inside Dan's brain. Everyone's got their own story. Everyone's story is a little bit different. But you'll see some common threads as we go into the next chunk of this teaching of what causes homosexuality, what are some of the building blocks of homosexuality, what are God's fixes, You'll, of course, remember every word that beautifully said this whole half hour. That been, yeah, okay. Anyway, hopefully the Holy Spirit will remind you of a few things I've said in my story as we look at the building blocks. And hopefully as you talk to somebody on the streets who is desperate for that living water, that thinks living water can be found in whatever sin they're engaged in, we'll trust that the Holy Spirit will remind you. Right now, this is what you can say. But God, what about this? I want to tell No, no, hold on to that. Hold that thought right now. Talk to that person about this. And so that's why I like to help you get inside my head, my little story, so that when you're talking to somebody, you realize, you know, what on earth happened to you that you are responding to life in that way? And by the way, that was one of the cool things, and I thank God for it, when my compassion started coming back in the grief cycle. And as that Circle K buying my coffee, don't mess with Dan before he gets his coffee. But there was a, a, a woman there that had obviously rejected her femininity, man. She was about this. I would be afraid to tangle with this woman if she had both hands tied behind her back. And I began to realize, wow, Jesus, what happened to that poor thing? That she has so rejected her femininity. 
that she looks like she's ready to cut somebody in half with her eyes. And that's what we need to see and remember as we talk to people. No excuse for sin, but sometimes there's reasons why they're hiding in their sin. So let's look at it now. What causes homosexuality? There's a whole bunch of stuff out there, you know. Our brother talked some about the media. Uh, media is a huge one. By the way, go home and Google the overhauling of straight America. Now, have you ever read that? Because a lot of what you're saying is in that list. It, it's kind of like the World Trade Center bombing. It's devastating. It's horrible, but it was beautifully executed. It was brilliantly planned out. The overhauling of straight America was, I think, in the mid-'80s about this is how we get homosexuality accepted in the mainstream in American culture. And a lot of what our brother taught this morning is in that plan. They are executing it beautifully, absolutely, beautifully, unfortunately. It's, it's just amazing. So anyway, choice. Who in this room has any habitual sin that you struggle with, addiction or whatever, at least now or in the past? Who, who in this room has ever struggled with a sin that just is this monster sin that you, you have? Never? I wish. We'll, we'll have you repent for lying in a minute. How many of you that raised your hand, which should be all of us, ever laid awake in bed one night trying to think, you know, my life is going way too good. What can I do to really mess it up? Oh, I know. I'll become an alcoholic. That sounds like a good idea. Or I know I'll get addicted to porn. Or I know I'll have same-sex attraction. So we don't choose whatever sin so easily besets us or a besetting sin. We don't choose it. It just sort of seems like a good idea at the time. And a lot of time we just kind of gravitate to it as that, that pull of sin comes. But we don't choose it. And this is where if you go up to somebody in the GLBT community and say, come on, it is a choice. You need to stop being gay. They are going to look at you like you have three eyes on your head. Because they're thinking, do you think for a minute I would have ever chosen this? Now, occasionally you get somebody that will be brutally, yeah, I did choose it. But what the reality of it is and the way that we can phrase it for them is, look, I know you did not choose your same-sex attraction. I know that in some ways, yeah, you had to sign up to be a prostitute, but I know that that desire and all that, so you didn't necessarily even choose that. But where the choice came in is what you chose to engage in it. You chose to embrace your same-sex attraction and act on it. You didn't choose to have the temptations. I get that. But you chose that. You didn't choose to be an alcoholic. You chose to pound the drinks at the bar. And so the choice is, do we choose to engage in the sinful behavior of whatever variety, or we, do we choose to submit it to the cross as beautiful and desirous as that sinful behavior is in our hearts? Can we submit that to the cross and choose to live a holy life? Hebrews 12.1, Wherefore, seeing we are also compassed about with so great a cloud of witnesses, let us lay aside every weight and the sin which does so easily beset us, and let us run the patience with patience the race that is set before us. So that choice coming in, and, and this is where being careful with our vocabulary can have huge dividends. Look, I know you didn't choose this, but we can choose to not embrace these things and go to Jesus, submit them to the cross, as we all have to, as we all have to. And, and another thing I'll talk to teenagers is about is, okay, you're same-sex attraction. You're saying God made you this way. You should embrace it and be a gay Christian. Your dad's straight, I'm assuming. Yeah, my dad's straight. Do you think for a minute that your 50-year-old dad, whose heart is still beating, ever has to resist the urge to lust after the gorgeous neighbor lady across the street that's hitting on him? And you see this stunned, horrified look on their face. Well, your dad is still breathing. He's still alive. He's a red-blooded male. And everyone has sexual temptations. And so your dad has to choose to resist those temptations for heterosexual sin that are so natural to him that he was born with and submit them to the, cro the cross. He should not choose to embrace his heterosexual temptation, identify himself as a adulterous Christian, and celebrate the diversity of sexuality that God gave him. Culture will never phrase it this way. You won't see that on modern family. But it helps frame this battle for the teenagers and the adults that you deal with. Everyone has sexual temptations. Let's choose to submit them to the cross and go from there.
And what about demonic? Demonic forces oppose us, and they lead us astray on a whole lot of fronts. 2 Corinthians 4, 3 through 4, If the good news we preach is veiled from anyone, it is a sign that they are perishing. Satan, the god of this evil world, have blinded the minds of those who don't believe. So they're unable to see the glorious light of the good news that is shining upon them. Again, that's why I believe it's so important to speak into their hearts to the root issues like the woman at the well. They can't get the scripture says, just don't. Yeah, well, who cares? That book's written 2,000 years ago, you know. But if we, through the Holy Spirit, can speak into their hearts, they don't understand the message we preach about the glory of Christ, who is the exact likeness of God. But as we speak in the power of the Holy Spirit, speaking into that deep need of their hearts through trusting the Holy Spirit to lead their conversation, it opens their minds. The more we open our hearts to any sin, the more susceptible we are to demonic oppression. It's just the reality of it. And then deliverance, it's important. I do deliverance praying with people. But it's so important. And because Satan does not have the ability to oppress us and harass us where we do not have an agreement with him. And so one question I'll ask people as we're praying about deliverance, you know, is what's it seem like would happen if we made this demon go away? And you'll usually get an answer like, I will be the most happy, joyous guy on the face of the planet, man. This demon's gone. That's true. You believe that here. And you believe that in part of your heart. But no demonic force can oppress you unless you've got an agreement with it or a buy-in. You sign on the dotted line somewhere. So listen to that part of your heart that really doesn't want it to go away. It won't be logical. It won't make sense to your brain. It will seem really true in your heart. And sometimes I'll ask a half of a question and let them finish it. I really don't want this demon of whatever, in my case, isolation to go away because, and then I stopped talking and let them finish from the illogical brokenness in their heart. And I actually said, you know, because if I make this demon of isolation go away, I will be all alone and by myself. Now, you bet your bottom dollar, my brain knew that was just crazy. But my heart, that stronghold was just so, Jesus, Dan believes that if he makes this demon of isolation go away, he will be all by himself. Jesus, what's your truth? And letting the Holy Spirit speak. <sighs> yeah, Jesus will be there. Right? He's there with me. And this demon is keeping me from being connected to people. And all. In Jesus' name, I renounce the demon of isolation. In Jesus' name, go away. And freedom comes. So we deal with this discipleship, right? You've got those patterns. Let's make it go away. So sanctification really does. You know, there, I love deliverance and thank God for it, the power of the cross. But our job's not done there. And the gay community looks at us as the pray the gay away people and the cast out the gay people because maybe of some of that rejection and shunning. But hey, let's, yeah, we're going to pray the gay away, but it's not that easy. We'll pray the gay away. We're going to walk with you. We're going to help you. We're going to trust God to show you things. Genetic biological. This is huge, right? Ask pretty much any typical person in popular culture, hey, is there a genetic link to, al- to um, homos? Oh, yeah, it's been proven. The, the concept is that it has been. In articles like Newsweek that says gay, this is from the, what, 80s or 90s, gay gene on the front cover, there's maybe a little question mark, I can't quite remember. And if you open it up, you see from the author of that study, now it's important to tell you what we did not find. We did not find a genetic indicator for homosexuality. We merely said if there is one, it would probably be in this area of the genetic markers. But USA Today, all the media just trumpets, hey, they found a gay gene. They did not. The American Psychological Association. Now, these are the, the secular gurus of life. Like you said, you know, the social worker will believe everything's fine. These are the people that really call the shots. You know, they have their Bible, the, the American Psychiatric Association, their Diagnostic and Statistic Manual and all that. They've actually admitted in 2008 that they, we don't know what causes homosexuality. There is no consensus among scientists about the exact reasons that an individual develops a heterosexual, bisexual, gay, or lesbian orientation. Although much research has been examined, the possible genetic, hormonal, developmental, social, and cultural influences on sexual orientation. That's a lot of stuff, right? I love this. No findings have emerged that permit scientists to conclude that sexual orientation is determined by any particular factor or factors. Many think in that nature and nurture both play complex roles. Most people experience little or no sense of choice about their sexual orientation. That's as close as the American Psychiatric Association will ever get to admitting you aren't born gay. 
You know what's astounding? Even, you know, and I have a nephew who is a gay advocate. Even if I'm talking to him and trying to speak the truth in love, oh, D Uncle Dan, they found it. They've got scientific proof and all these studies. Mark, the American Psychiatric Association has actually said we don't know what causes it. What do you think happens when you talk to a gay advocate and bring something like this up? Anger. Why? Why would I be angry? Why don't I say thank you, Christopher, for enlightening me? And if I were actually convinced that it's okay, right. if I didn't have inner turmoil, would I get mad at you? No. I would just roll my eyes at you. Oh, poor little um, uninformed, you know, goofy Aunt Uncle Dan or Aunt Krista or whoever, right? So that shows you that level of anger that we get when we confront them, even gently. I mean, you, you can say it as gently as possible with a dozen roses. They're going to get angry. That inner defense system is so fragile and flimsy, and there's, there is really an inner turmoil. It comes out as anger. And, and that's you know, just one thing to keep in mind. So let's look at uh, what's the deal with this. Why is there such a push to have homosexuality accepted? This is really, in a nutshell, the whole argument summed up. By linking homosexuality to the genes, says New York psychiatrist Kenneth Paul Rosenberg, Hammer's study shows that being gay is not a deviant choice and the result of a lack of will. It is at least partially a biological orientation as important to one's constitution as eye color. How important is eye color to me as a person? It's not. It's really no big deal. And if it is a big deal, that's actually pretty shallow. But that's why it is such a big deal that we keep promoting that we're born gay. Because it's really, I have brown hair, I have black hair, I have whatever. It's just, it is. And so that's it. But let's take that and apply that across the board, right? Across the board. In a booklet, and there's an awesome booklet series by Focus on the Family and Love One Out. I hope it's still available on the Resource Center. Um, Straight Answers, Exposing the Myths and Facts about Homosexuality. I love this quote. A genetic link to some behaviors does not prove the idea of normalcy or rightness. Look at alcoholism or propensities towards anger. While these have been promoted as having a genetic linkage, there are very few, if any, in our society who would promote these behaviors as okay just because they're linked genetically, right? Oh, there are genetic indicators, I believe, for bipolar or schizophrenic. That's okay. Just Let's have a schizophrenic pride parade next week. Let's say, you know, we'll head this up. It'll be really, it would be interesting, right? No. And, and one time, as Bob Duco would say, it's the kind of thing that makes my eye twitch. One of the rare times I was watching Dr. Phil, of course, he knows everything. Watching Dr. Phil, it was um, Born to Rage was the name of the episode. And he was talking about the genetic indicators for rage. And he even said, he acknowledged the elephant in the room. Look, now, just because you have a genetic indicator for rage, does that mean you get to scream at everybody and rage and just yell? He said, no. That means that, unfortunately, you will have to work harder than everyone else in society to behave properly. Uh, seriously, let's apply that then to homosexuality, but we don't want to. And, you know, our brother brought up some tests. If you bring up any scientific research, no matter how well done, that says homosexuality is changeable or that a little kid needs a mom and a dad, as one of those studies, it's, it's pretty close to career suicide. We don't, don't confuse us with the facts. We know what our heart tells us and we're going in that direction. But those are the people you're talking to. Don't confuse me with the facts. My truth, because of my own experience, says this. And that's how they gauge truth. So there we go. Further information. This book is awesome. If you can still get it, um, Neil, Bri Neil and Briar Whitehead. <coughs> it's from 1999, so it looks at research. You can ac actually download it for free from here. And I'm excited. I just found out this website in the last couple weeks. It's from New Zealand. So it's www.mygenes.co.nz from New Zealand. That is actually a website from the author of this book who has kept up with the scientific research and does a very thorough job of looking at it. So I just, just, just found this uh, website in the last couple weeks. And it, it says on here, it's a clinical website. Everybody's welcome here, though. So the language, the verbiage may be a little bit academic, but it's good. So I would highly recommend this.
Other information, our own website, recommend.org, short for Reconciliation Ministries, and RestoredHopeNetwork.org. Um, there is another ministry that has excellent resources for adolescents, PortlandFellowship.org. Jason? He's a cool brother. He's doing great. Jason um, Thompson directs uh, Portland Fellowship. They have excellent resources for teens. So other ones, NARTH.com, National Association for the Research and Therapy of Homosexuality. This is a secular website, which actually makes me kind of like it a lot more because it doesn't look like a bunch of, you know, the Flanders on the Simpsons trying to push their agenda. It's a bunch of secular people that, that do research summaries. They're the ones that have said, look, we've got 100 years of research that proves that, guys, that people can change their orientation. It does recognize the continuum of change. I think they're up to volume maybe three now in this journal. But they do research summaries. They come out in little booklets. Their website has a lot of excellent research summaries on them. Once in a while, I'll post some of that on the Reconciliation Ministries Facebook page. Yes. N-A-R-T-H dot com. Okay. How are you guys doing? Do you need a, like a stand-up break? Doing all right? Awesome. Okay. Um, let's look at some environmental stuff here. Now, this is really what we call the developmental model. I got kids. I'll tell you what. Before I lost my son, the hardest thing I had ever gone through in my entire life was raising teenagers. I love my kids, but seriously, it almost did me in. I'm serious. It almost just like brought me to the breaking point. Five kids, two extremely high-maintenance kids that were, by the way, high-maintenance in part because of my contribution and my brokenness. Mm -hmm. Did you ever try and get an addict to be friendly or to admit? And who's, whose fault is it if you're, an, if you're an addict? Everybody else's, right? Not my fault. So my anger and stuff, I, I did you know, do some damage to my kids. I repented. Yet we're trusting God, help them, Lord. But I'll tell you what, and I always share this because I know what parents will do as they're hearing this. Oh, my goodness, I, I really messed up my kid. Relax, breathe. We all have human parents. That's another place where it gets dicey, all right? We all have the grace of God to overcome our human parents. If we're Christian parents and we repent and we own what we need to repent and own for to our kids, that goes a long way. So... I just want to let you relax as you hear some of this stuff. I know especially moms, man, and dads, their heart just breaks as they hear this stuff. And remember, a lot of it is perceptions. My perception is more powerful than reality because what I, it's what I really truly believe. So, okay, let's dig into this a little bit, the environmental. Let's look at the development of a heterosexual gender identity. Homosexuality101.com. Homosexuality101.com. She, I saw her teach in Southfield. She basically teaches a lot of what I taught, you know, will teach in the developmental model. And this is where I got the uh, gender identity stuff from. You know, when you're born, mom's everything, right? Newborns, you know, you've got that distance as mom's nursing the baby. It's an awesome time. Moms teach you it's safe to be alive. I'm okay to be alive. If I have a, a need, mommy will fix it, you know, and, and, and it's okay. Uh, it's good. You get into being one and a half to three years old, it's critical there for a little boy to pull away from mommy and really start bonding with dad. But at the same time, for a little girl, the little girl connects with mom, and she learns what it's like to be a little, little girl and a mom. So ideally, one and a half to three-ish years old, I'm bonding with my dad and getting that maleness built into me. As our brother said, learning how to be a boy, because I'm watching my dad and my uncles and my brothers, and they're being godly men. Or if I'm a, a, a little girl, I'm bonding with my mom, my aunts, my sisters. We're doing girl stuff, making cookies for the boys to devour in about three seconds, and all those wonderful things. It's a good God-given thing that's even mocked now. Yes, sir. Oh, <laughs> amen. So it's a good thing. Ages five and up. What do we do when we're five? Where do we go? Typically, school. We're going to school, man, and it's like bonding with same-sex peers. How do, I become, how do I be one of the boys now? I'm okay with dad. He taught me a little bit about my boyness, my, his dadness, and all that kind of stuff. How do I really become one of the boys and learn what it's like to be a boy? And, you know, you know kind of at that point, girls have cooties, and, you know, we're doing boys. We're playing dodgeball, and, you know, we can, 
you know, get bounced around. We can wrestle and do all those things. And the girls are playing girls, and they're playing chase, and, you know, like tag, and hee-hee-hee, and four square, and all that hopscotch thing on how in the world you don't break your neck by trying to stand on one foot and pick it up. Kind of like playing Twister. But they're doing girl things with girls. The boys are doing boy things. And then you turn into adolescence. The hormones kick in. At this point in healthy development, since we know what it's like to be a man from our dad, we've learned some of that stuff, we know what it's like to be one of the boys, the hormones kick in, and we become intrigued by the opposite, by what we really don't know, and the mystique of the opposite sex. And there's a curiosity there, and as Christians, a godly attraction, which we have to help the kids through. You know, there is that appreciation of the feminine that the boy should have, but it should be in the godly variety. Same thing with the females, and really liking that. Now, remember part of my testimony. I didn't have bonding with my same-sex parent because dad's going to turn into a monster and that wall goes up. So that doesn't get put in there. I didn't feel like one of the boys because I was picked after the girls. They would probably have, you know, somebody in a body cast on their team before they'd have me on their team. And so it told me I'm not one of the boys. I played chase with the girls. I tried to play hopscotch with the, I don't know if I ever tried that. Foursquare I did. That's kind of a boys and girls, but primarily girls back then. I played those games. So I didn't know what it was like to be one of the boys. And so when adolescence kicked in for me, what I was curious about, what I couldn't really relate to is these guys. How do you be masculine like that in gym class? How do you climb that rope and not, like, break your neck and try? I couldn't even get up, like, you know, one or two, you know, whatever is up there. How do you do those things? And so somehow, though, because the hormones are kicking in, I'm intrigued now by the males that I don't understand. It becomes eroticized and sexualized. And then they throw us in the locker room where we have to shower in front of everybody and the shame and the body image issues and all this. And wow, those guys, those guys are already developed. I'm not as good as them. And that envy. And in homosexuality, there's a lot of envy, a lot of bitterness, a lot of envy. And so it gets short-circuited. So this is a perfect world. But we see now if these things don't happen when adolescence kicks in, now I'm intrigued by the unknown of my own gender. And that's what I want to connect with. You know, there's just thinking off the top of my head in Corinthians, it talks about if we knit our heart to a prostitute, become one with that prostitute. What do you think some of that sexual attraction towards our own gender might be based in? I have a masculinity void in me. If I can connect sexually to another guy, spiritually we become one. Maybe it pretends to fill that masculinity void. Just a thought. Something to to pray about, to think about. um, So let's look now. Building blocks of homosexuality. We'll look through these, and you'll you'll hear a lot of familiar traits. You will see in many of the people we talk to on the streets, Now, with culture being so accepted of homosexuality, this may not be as ironclad as it was about 10 years ago. You know, if I go to my junior high school class and there's a gay straight alliance and they they kind of lean me that way, I may not have the resistance. So some of this stuff may not be as clear cut in the younger generation, but it's still there. Males break down a relationship with same-sex parents. The dad's extremely passive or demeaning. My dad is very passive, 98 percent of the time except for the two percent of the time where he threatened to turn into a monster or when I went up to him to help me with my toy and he said you know what I'll help you with this one more time then just leave me alone I don't I can't hang out with my dad so extremely passive or demeaning mom may be trying to gain emotional fulfillment from son so if the dad's passive or demeaning he ain't going to be the husband of the year and the mom's going to fill that void and what if she's trying to get some of her need for male connection Fulfilled through that boy. So sometimes the mother can be overly engaged or enmeshed with the son emotionally. And the term for this used to send chills down my spine pre some healing prayer sessions. But we call this emotional incest. So maybe nothing physical is going on. But there's an emotional incest. The mom doesn't have a connection with her husband. She wants a connection with a man. Here's a teenage boy in her house. She tries to make him the adult child and meshes with him. Now, what do you think if mom's doing this emotional incest over enmeshment thing with the boy, when the hormones do kick in, I've had a guy tell me he freaked out at the thought that he was supposed to connect sexually with a woman because it reminded him too much of that enmeshment with mom. And so there's that built-in repellent. 
And we'll look at some other issues with females. Females, as we all know, are a lot more